Welcome to Physics Twist. Today is a special edition episode. In this episode of Physics Twist, Mars Rovers. That's it, Mars Rovers. It's your host, Duncan, and this week, I'm all alone. So we're talking about one of my favourite topics for which there is a lot of news recently. Mars Rovers. Parachute deploy. Parachute. That is the sound of cheers from the team at NASA that successfully landed a totally bonkers golf cart-sized robot on Mars. In fact, they landed two. Then, eight years later, they landed another one. So I want to tell you two Mars rover stories this week. The first is about the Opportunity rover and its twin, Spirit, both of which landed in 2004. The second is about the Curiosity rover, which landed in 2012. We heard audio from the landing of Spirit earlier. Spirit and Opportunity are part of NASA's Mars Exploration Rover mission. The aim of this mission is to, over the course of 90 sols, or 90 Martian days, explore Mars' surface and to look for clues about past water activity on Mars. Spirit was launched in June 2003, and Opportunity followed about three weeks later. It takes about seven months to get to Mars, so both Spirit and Opportunity landed in January of 2004. The strategy for landing Spirit and Opportunity was an unusual one. Parachutes would decelerate the landers, and seconds before impact, giant airbags exploded outwards, protecting the rovers as they bounced along the surface of Mars. Once they'd successfully landed, things didn't exactly kick off with a bang. After landing, NASA lost contact with Spirit. While Spirit was transmitting some signals, they didn't actually mean anything, and it wasn't properly relaying signals to satellites orbiting Mars. The only signal it did send was a beep telling NASA that it was broken. For 10 days, Spirit sat quiet and alone while NASA ran tests, eventually updating its software to fix some onboard computer issues. By early February, Spirit was ready to drive away, beginning its journey on Mars. By March, NASA already had some big news. A news conference was held announcing a major discovery, that Opportunity had found evidence of past liquid water on the Martian surface. Huge. Dr. Steve Squires of Cornell University, who was the principal investigator for the science instruments on Opportunity and its twin spirit, said, Liquid water once flowed through these rocks. It changed their texture, and it changed their chemistry. We've been able to read the telltale clues the water left behind, giving us confidence in that conclusion. Dr James Garvin, lead scientist for Mars and Lunar Exploration at NASA headquarters Washington, said, NASA launched the Mars Exploration Rover mission specifically to check whether at least one part of Mars ever had a persistently wet environment that could possibly have been hospitable to life. Today we have strong evidence for an exciting answer. Yes. Steve Squires later went on to say, We think Opportunity is parked on what was once the shoreline of a salty sea on Mars. Spirit also found evidence of liquid water, this time in a rock they nicknamed Humphrey. You've got to love that even though they're doing this amazing work, NASA scientists still have a sense of humour. Anyway, they determined Humphrey was a volcanic rock made from magma that had at one point actual liquid water flowing through it. Not long after this, Spirit passed 90 sols, or 90 Mars days, on the Mars surface. This was its mission target. Over the next four years, it continued to traverse Mars, reaching incredibly pleasantly named places like Bonneville Crater, Columbia Hills, Husband Hill, and Cumberland Ridge. In 2006, while driving to the north face of McCool Hill, one of its front wheels completely seized up. Never once to give up, the control team programmed the rover to drive toward McCool Hill backwards, dragging its broken wheel behind it. (laughs) 
Meanwhile, Opportunity had been enjoying continued success on Mars. In April 2004, Opportunity reached Endurance Crater, which was formed by a meteor impact and had been named after a ship led by Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton. In June, because of the fact that deeper and older layers of rock are exposed inside the crater, NASA decided to drive Opportunity into it, even if it wasn't able to drive back out. It spent half a year inside Endurance Crater, doing a lot of science during that time, including spotting some thin clouds. That's right, clouds on Mars. And managed to drive out despite the wheels slipping on loose dust. After leaving Endurance, Opportunity spent the next few months being a very busy rover indeed. It tracked back to find its own heat shield, which was used to absorb heat from the atmosphere during the landing on Mars. While visiting the heat shield, it discovered a meteorite, the first meteorite ever found on another planet, which was aptly named Heat Shield Rock. Over the next few months, it visited the Argo, Alvin, Jason, Bostock and Natural East craters, setting a record for the longest distance driven on Mars in a single day at 220 metres. For context, it would take you about two or three minutes to walk that same distance. But then, in April 2005, trouble. As it was trying to drive over a small sand dune, Opportunity's wheels dug into the sand. Radio signals can take between 4 and 24 minutes to bounce between Earth and Mars, so real-time remote-controlled driving is not possible. Driving is automated instead. Not knowing what it was doing, Opportunity was driving itself further and further, deeper and deeper, into its own dusty Martian grave. All four corner wheels had dug themselves more than halfway down the rim. Opportunity was stuck. Really stuck. NASA scientists ran simulation after simulation, trying to figure out how to get Opportunity free. This was a painstaking operation, and Opportunity would attempt to move a few centimetres at a time, before snapping a photo to send back to Earth for NASA engineers to check its progress. Over the next five weeks, Opportunity spun its wheels so many times, had it been on solid ground, it would have moved 192 full metres. Instead, it moved only one. This one metre was all it needed to escape. Opportunity reversed out of the dune, studied it for almost two full weeks, and moved on towards its next major target. In September of 2006, Opportunity arrived at the rim of Victoria Crater, an amazing 730 metres wide, six times larger than Endurance Crater. Opportunity started navigating around the crater in a clockwise direction, naming the various bays and capes after landmarks visited by Ferdinand Magellan aboard the ship, Victoria. Opportunity was looking for an entry point that would allow it to drive into the crater. After driving a quarter of the way round the crater, and for six weeks dealing with a dust storm that seriously threatened itself and spirit, Opportunity drove into the crater at a point called Duck Bay. Opportunity spent more than a year studying the geology of the crater and taking high-resolution photos, and then backed out and headed on to its next stop, another crater called Endeavour. Endeavour Crater is huge. At 22 kilometres across, it absolutely dwarfs both the Endurance and Victoria craters. For context, Victoria Crater is about eight football pitches long. Endurance Crater at 22 kilometres, is 240 football pitches long. Or for our Sydney listeners, about as far as going from the Sydney CBD to Cronulla Beach as the crow flies. That's a big crater. Endeavour Crater was also really, really far away. Opportunity drove about seven kilometres from the original landing site to get to Victoria Crater. It had about 12 kilometres to drive from Victoria Crater to Endeavour Crater. NASA engineers estimated it would take about two years to drive that distance. So off it went. Meanwhile, 
In 2008, 1,724 days into its 90-day mission, Spirit encountered a dust storm that clouded the Martian atmosphere, reducing the amount of sunlight its solar panels could receive, meaning its battery power levels were at a minimum. NASA attempted to conserve energy by shutting down systems for extended periods of time, including the heaters which it needed to keep from freezing. Spirit later awoke and communicated with mission control as scheduled, although its solar panels were covered with dust, which threatened its ability to continue the mission. But then, on February 6, 2009, a huge wind blew off some of the dust which had gathered on the panels, increasing their power output. In April, even more dust was blown away by what NASA called cleaning events, increasing power output by a third again. NASA funneled most of this extra power into furthering their driving efforts. But then, in May, Spirit became bogged down in soft soil. The JPL, or Jet Propulsion Lab team, decided that to get Spirit back on track, they needed to use computer simulations and scale models to figure out the best plan of attack. To accurately represent the lower gravity on Mars, they used a lighter model of Spirit in a specially built sandpit with soil that matched the dust on Mars. For months, NASA attempted to free the stuck Spirit. But it didn't work. NASA decided to redefine the mobile robot mission by calling it a stationary research platform. With no way to move or reorient its solar panels to get more light, Spirit then went into hibernation mode for the Martian winter. It would never reawaken. After 2,623 souls and 7 kilometres travelled, we said goodbye to Spirit. But opportunity kept going. The year is now 2011. Opportunity is still traversing Mars on its way to Endeavour Crater. On the way, it discovers another 90-metre-wide crater named Santa Maria. And while at Santa Maria, Mars and Earth underwent something called a solar conjunction, where the Sun is placed exactly between Earth and Mars, and so communication is impossible. This period lasted two weeks. After doing plenty of science at Santa Maria, Opportunity resumed its journey towards Endeavour, on the way passing the milestone of 30 kilometres driven, 50 times its originally planned capability. In August of 2011, Opportunity finally arrived at Endeavour Crater, after having driven a total of 21 kilometres from Victoria Crater. By the way, the name Endeavour might sound familiar. First of all, it's the name of a space shuttle, but secondly, it's also the name of a ship commanded by British Royal Navy Captain Lieutenant James Cook during his first voyage to Australia and New Zealand when the first contact between Europeans and their Indigenous peoples happened. NASA actually announced that the Opportunity team would use the theme of names given to places visited by Opportunity for sites at Endeavour Crater. That's a neat little Australian connection, I think. NASA elected not to drive Opportunity into the crater, because it appeared to contain similar rocks to the ones seen previously. Instead, they decided to drive around the perimeter, noting sites like Cape Tribulation, named after the headland in Queensland, Cape Dromedary, named for the mountain on the south coast of New South Wales, now known as Mount Gulliga, Cape Byron, the most easterly point of the Australian mainland in New South Wales, Point Hicks, the part of the Australian mainland first sighted by the Endeavour in 1770, Nobby's Head at Newcastle Harbour, and Botany Bay, the site of HMS Endeavour's first landing at Australia. Opportunity spent the next few years travelling around the rim of Endeavour Crater, along the way becoming the farthest travelling extraterrestrial NASA vehicle. The overall record belongs to a Russian lunar rover, and discovering that water on Mars may have had a neutral pH, That is, it's neither acidic nor alkaline, just like pure water on Earth, which adds more credence to the hypothesis that Mars potentially could have supported life. 2014 on Mars started off with a mysterious bang. While taking pictures of the surface, Opportunity spotted a donut-shaped rock that had not appeared in any images taken previously. 
mysterious. So what was it? Stephen Squires, who I'd mentioned previously, thought that it was a rock that had been kicked up by the rover's wheels. But a gentleman by the name of Ron Joseph claimed it was a, quote, mushroom-like fungus, a composite organism consisting of colonies of lichen and cyanobacteria, and which on Earth is known as apotheceum. Joseph filed a lawsuit requesting that the agency, quote, perform a public, scientific and statutory duty, which is to closely photograph and thoroughly scientifically examine and investigate a putative biological organism. Basically, he accused NASA of hiding evidence of alien life. Joseph claims he examined it himself and that, quote, the same structure in miniature was clearly visible upon magnification and appears to have just germinated from spores. That is, the rock, or whatever it is, had somehow grown right there in front of Opportunity. Turns out that Opportunity had already examined this rock. Quote Stephen Squires again, We've looked at it with our microscope. It is clearly a rock. Well, that's that then. Later in January of 2014, Opportunity celebrated its 10th birthday on Mars. Skipping ahead a bit to 2016, the European Space Agency had launched a Mars lander called Schiaparelli, which they planned to land near the Endeavour crater. Schiaparelli was supposed to jettison a parachute, then use rockets and a crumple zone like that on a car to soften its landing. NASA worked with the ESA, aiming to have Opportunity take photos of the lander as it was descending. As Schiaparelli was coming down, Opportunity did take photos, but due to the uncertainty of the exact landing site, none of them captured Schiaparelli. Later that year, satellite imagery confirmed Schiaparelli had crashed into the surface of Mars at about 500 kilometers an hour, scorching the landscape like burnt rubber from a Martian drag race. Opportunity continued to traverse the rim of Endeavour Crater, passing 5,000 souls on the way, and also overtaking the Russian lunar rover Lunokhod 2 to become the farthest travelling extraterrestrial vehicle ever. Which brings us to the 1st of June 2018. It was a dark and stormy night. Just kidding. But seriously, it was. A satellite orbiting Mars spotted a storm forming over 1,000 kilometres away from Opportunity. That's about the same distance as Sydney to Melbourne. And even though the storm was so far away, it was actually darkening the sky over the rover. Like I said, a dark and stormy Martian night. Because the dust in the sky was blocking more than 99% of sunlight, Opportunity's solar panels were generating next to no power, meaning it had to use only battery power to stay alive. On June 10, the dust storm had grown to cover an area larger than all of the US and Canada and Mexico and Russia combined. NASA formulated a plan. To save power, Opportunity would wake only to receive commands during the morning, then sleep more than an entire day to wake up the next afternoon to do some weather testing. On June 12, Opportunity entered a safe mode, or a type of hibernation, and will not wake again until more sunlight can hit its solar panels and recharge its batteries. The risk now is whether the rover will stay warm enough through the dust storm so it doesn't freeze, and whether the dust swirling around in the atmosphere will settle on the solar panels, completely blocking them all from sunlight. By June 20, the dust storm covered the entire planet. It's likely to stay this way for weeks or even months. So now, after more than 5,100 souls on Mars, to opportunity we say good luck and Godspeed. You might think that NASA had their hands full with opportunity and spirit up to this point. But back on Earth, they'd been busy building another rover. This one, called Curiosity, was a huge step up from Spirit and Opportunity. Instead of running off solar panels, which proved to be somewhat of an Achilles heel in Spirit and Opportunity, due to their tendency to be covered by dust, and there's a lot of dust on Mars, Curiosity was to be powered by its own onboard nuclear power station. Curiosity is also huge. 
about the size of a car and twice as big as Spirit and Opportunity. Like Spirit and Opportunity, one of the main questions Curiosity was sent to answer is, could Mars have ever harboured life? We know the conditions that are good for life because we're in them right now. Those conditions basically are, it has to be warm and it has to be wet. Right now, Mars is like a giant desert. Think about the deserts here on Earth. Not so great for life, right? We already know that Mars had some water previously, so Curiosity was sent with the objective of finding out, was it ever warm? If it was, does this mean it might have been habitable? If so, when? And for how long? NASA came up with three more specific scientific objectives. Number one, investigate if there are any organic compounds. Organic compounds contain the element carbon, and these are important because all known life is based on organic carbon compounds. Number two, investigate the presence of other chemical building blocks of life, known by the acronym CHNOPS. That's C-H-N-O-P-S for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, which are the six most important chemical elements that we find in most biological molecules on Earth. Number three, investigate any leftover effects from biological processes. These are called biosignatures or chemical fossils, which is any substance that provides evidence for past life. Curiosity was launched in 2011 and took eight months to get to Mars, landing in 2012. The landing at Gale Crater was done entirely automatically with a super cool rocket powered landing system called Sky Crane that hovered above the surface and sort of winched Curiosity down like an elevator before cutting the cables, flying away, and deliberately crash landing. There's actually some amazing high-resolution footage of the landing on YouTube, which I'll put in the show notes. That's right, there is high-resolution footage of a Mars landing. Mind-blowing. Here's some audio from Mission Control as Curiosity landed. Sky Crane has started. Descending at about 0.75 meters per second as expected. Expecting bridal cut shortly. Tango to us, you remain strong. Tango Delta nominal. New Jeff is good. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Time to see where our curiosity will take us. Curiosity briefly prepped itself for science and then drove off on its quest for life on Mars. And the results came in thick and fast. Get ready for this roller coaster. In March 2013, it had already found evidence of conditions that may have been suitable for life by drilling inside a rock next to a stream bed at Gale Crater. Scientists identified sulfur, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and carbon, some of those key chemical ingredients for life that we talked about before. This stream bed could have been part of a river system that provided chemical energy and conditions that microbes just love. As the lead scientist for the program, Michael Meyer, said, the fundamental question for this mission is whether Mars could have supported a habitable environment. From what we know now, the answer is yes. Huge. So Curiosity had already found evidence for favourable conditions for life. But get ready for the first terrifying, not altogether fun downhill slope of our roller coaster ride. Remember how NASA was looking for leftover signs of previous Martian life called biosignatures? Well, one of those is a gas called methane. Here on Earth, much of the methane in the atmosphere is released by living things like cattle and us humans in the form of, yep, farts. Microbes also make heaps of methane. NASA thought it had seen plumes of methane coming from Mars before, using telescopes and satellites orbiting Mars. So it was thought that Curiosity would be able to confirm the presence of methane, and by extension, and because methane breaks down fairly quickly, it would indicate life in the form of microbes currently on Mars. So Curiosity whipped out its fancy chemical detector, the tunable laser spectrometer, Look for some methane, and... Bingo! Methane. 
But then they realised that some of the methane-rich Florida air had leaked into the machine. So their result was... Bull. Pardon the pun. Must be lots of farts in Florida, I guess. So Curiosity filtered out the contamination and had another go. And... Nothing. No methane. This result was pretty unexpected and a big blow in the search for life on Mars. Curiosity then began driving to its major destination, Mount Sharp. By the end of its first year on Mars, Curiosity had driven more than a mile, taken 70,000 images, and fired its rock vaporizing laser more than 70,000 times at 2,000 targets. To celebrate its first birthday, NASA programmed its super neat onboard vibrating chemistry lab to play a little song. So if anyone on Mars was listening, they'd be able to sing along to this. This is what it actually sounds like. About a month after its birthday, Curiosity analysed some Mars soil in its onboard chemistry lab and discovered that about 2% of the soil on the surface of Mars is actually water and that the water molecules bind to those tiny particles of soil. Again coming through with a fantastic naming scheme, Curiosity analysed a rock called Jake M and found that it was an igneous rock or a rock that formed from molten rock, basically lava from a volcano and that this particular rock is completely unlike others found on Mars, and really similar to the ones that we find here on this strange planet we call Earth. By February, engineers had noticed a higher than expected amount of wear on Curiosity's wheels, and so decided to drive backwards for a bit to reduce the wear. Now, just as a quick aside about the wheels... In December of 2017, I went to see a talk by a guy called Dave Lavery, who heads up robotics at NASA. He told a story about how NASA had gotten a little bit sick of the JPL team slapping their logo on everything. Rockets, JPL. Wings, JPL. Robots, JPL. Everything, JPL. So they told them to tone it down a little bit. Anyway, they were building Curiosity and had to come up with a new design for the wheels. The new design had to incorporate something called visual odometry, which is a fancy way of saying the wheels had to have a pattern built into them, like the bottom of your shoes, so it could look back at its tracks, count how many times the pattern repeated, and then calculate how far it had driven, and compare that to its onboard calculations to see if the wheels were slipping, or if new driving plans had to be made, or whatever. So they said, look, someone needs to design these new wheels, and one of the JPL guys says, sure, I'll do it. He comes back after a few months with a completed design, it gets approved, then built, slapped onto Curiosity, and fired off into space on its mission to Mars. Later on they realise, hold on, that's a funny pattern. Turns out it was Morse code. And Morse code, for anyone who doesn't know, is a really simple code that translates the alphabet into on-off tones, or clicks, that are either short or long. It's been around for more than 160 years and is traditionally used in aviation, on ships, amateur radio, that sort of thing. Anyway, they have a look at the pattern that Curiosity's been laying down all across Mars and lo and behold, it's this. And what does that say? JPL, 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 JPL. JPL, 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 JPL. Those cheeky JPL engineers had figured out a way to get around the logo ban and instead plaster it all over Mars. Those cheeky geeks. Reading articles about it, it sounds as though NASA knew about this all along, but personally I prefer Dave's version. So where were we? So in 2014... NASA rejigged their mission objectives and decided that Curiosity would now be focusing on searching for evidence of ancient life, which personally I think is a fantastic idea. 
This was a little bit hampered by the announcement that NASA discovered that microbes, like one called Terzococcus phoenicus, might be resistant to the cleaning methods usually used in spacecraft assembly rooms. Spacecraft that aim to detect life have to be completely free of any contamination. Otherwise, how do they know if what they found is actually from Mars, or if they carried it from Earth? It's not known right now if these microbes could survive the months-long journey into space, but they could be on Curiosity right now. But there's a potential problem even worse than just contaminating the science. NASA's Catherine Conley, who holds possibly the coolest job title ever, Planetary Protection Officer, later went on to say that 20 to 40,000 bacterial spores may have been on Curiosity at launch. This means that life on Mars likely exists right now, but not the way we wanted. This creates a huge catch-22 for Mars exploration. We want to find habitable conditions on Mars, but then if we find them, we're potentially dropping Earth-borne bacteria right on there, where it's most likely to grow and spread and ultimately contaminate the planet. Not good. Lots of other stuff happened in 2014. While it was mainly focused on driving to Mount Sharp, Curiosity discovered an iron meteorite and watched the planet Mercury move across the sun, the first time that's ever happened from another planet. Curiosity also celebrated its first full Martian year. It takes 687 days for Mars to completely orbit the sun, compared to 365 on Earth, and also celebrated its second birthday on Mars. In September, Curiosity finally arrived at the base of Mount Sharp, a five-kilometre high mountain in the middle of Gale Crater. Mount Sharp was originally found by the Mars Global Surveyor, a satellite orbiting Mars. One of the important differences between Mars and other bodies like, say, the Moon, is that Mars actually has an atmosphere. This atmosphere, along with previous bodies of water, means that stuff like rock can actually move around by wind. Rock can be eroded and moved somewhere else, creating layers of rock. And this is exactly what happened at Gale Crater. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, another satellite, later found that the layers of Mount Sharp actually change significantly with height. From bottom to top, the minerals change, the look changes, the chemicals change. So we can look at those layers and read them like a book, telling us exactly what happened during the early formation of Mars. So that's what Curiosity was here to do. And do, it did. Ascending up Mount Sharp, Curiosity found signs of actual salt water in the ground. Very salty, but water nonetheless. Looking at the layers, it found evidence for an ancient lake inside Gale Crater and rivers flowing into it. And they were huge, so there must have been massive amounts of water flowing over a really long period of time. So that means that the Martian atmosphere must have remained stable for millions and millions of years. That mysterious disappearing methane we talked about? Well, allow me to take you back up the roller coaster. A year after originally declaring that no real methane existed in the atmosphere, all but dashing hopes that life existed on Mars, NASA had some pretty huge news. Curiosity detected a burst of methane in the atmosphere that lasted two months. That is, methane levels suddenly and unusually increased, then decreased. Why? Well, one idea is that it came from microbes like we talked about before. The other is that it came from a chemical reaction between rocks and water. But that would require a heat source. And that's also very exciting because we'd always thought that, unlike Earth, Mars has a totally solid, dead core, which has meant no volcanic activity for more than 100 million years. So either this methane was generated by living microbes, or the planet isn't as geologically dead as we thought. Dun dun dun! So let's take a look back at those questions we asked earlier. Was Mars wet? Well, yes, we already know that it was. Was it warm? Yes, most likely. For those rivers and lakes to have existed, it must have been a little bit warm. And for how long? Tens of millions of years, maybe more. NASA summed up Curiosity's achievements thusly. The Curiosity mission has already achieved its main goal of determining whether the landing region ever offered environmental conditions that would have been favourable for microbial life, if Mars has ever hosted life. 
the mission found evidence of ancient rivers and lakes with a chemical energy source and all of the chemical ingredients necessary for life as we know it. Pretty incredible. Now let's bring us up to the present, or last month anyway, June of 2018. Huge news. First, remember how all known life is based in organic molecules? The ones that contain carbon? NASA announced that Curiosity had examined samples of three billion year old mudstones it had found and cooked them in order to analyze the gases they threw out. Boom. Organic molecules. On Mars. If we imagine life on Mars as being like a Lego car, we haven't just found individual Lego blocks, but the wheels and the doors too. We just don't know if a whole Lego car has ever been built. NASA were keen to stress that this isn't 100% proof for life, but it's another piece in an arrow-shaped jigsaw puzzle. And right now the arrow is kind of pointing to life on Mars. So what's next for exploring Mars? Well, NASA announced in 2012 that they'll launch another Mars rover in 2020 called Mars 2020. Very imaginative. (laughs) This rover will be very similar to Curiosity and will build on what Curiosity has learned, looking for further evidence of ancient habitability and also looking at the possibility of future manned missions to Mars. NASA also just announced that they want to launch a drone called the Marscopter. This will work just like a normal helicopter or drone here on Earth, using the atmosphere on Mars to fly. The tricky thing will be, Mars's atmosphere is about 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. So I can't wait for this. It's a very exciting time for space exploration. So let's see where our curiosity takes us, shall we? a wrap on this special edition episode of physics twist big thank you to time cop 1983 for providing music in this episode additional music from kevin mcleod at incompetech don't forget to listen to the official physics ed podcast with ben newsom thanks for listening